fast-moving cars should have been a clue. Some small arms fire there. You don't have to go very far to find the fighting. We're right on the outskirts of Donetsk, and as you can hear, there's a battle going on. We came to this bridge to film some of the destruction caused by the war. What we didn't realize was we're not entirely outside of the battle zone. Journalisti! See you Stayim, journalisti. Turns out I'm standing on a tank parked just under the bridge. A fighter, off camera, trains his gun on me and tells me not to move. Picture? He wants to check our documents. Satisfied with our papers, he relaxes and we're free. All right, well, here we go. Next day, we return better prepared. This is the flag jacket. Got our helmet here. Last but not least, fresh battery. We're being driven to the Donetsk International Airport the most fought-over piece of real estate in the entire war by a pro-Russian fighter who goes by the nickname Crimea to get a sense of what lies ahead. Two truces have collapsed already. Crimea thinks this one will too. He says a Ukrainian militia that enjoys a billionaire's backing is shooting at them right now. He wants to show something, he's going to show me. Just uh, keep, keep, keep a low profile, could be snipers. A series of strange moments awaits me. It's International Women's Day, big holiday here, and Crimea and the fighters have come with gifts for another member of the separatist Vostok Battalion. <laughs> Ukraine spent hundreds of millions of dollars building the airport. Donetsk was about to host the European Soccer Championship the country wanted to show the world it too could have a first-class airport. It's now a wasteland. Its only value is that of a buffer. This is utter destruction. I mean, I've been in demolition sites, war zones. I've never seen anything quite like this. It's not every day you see an armed personnel carrier in an airport terminal. It is more than clear, no one is going to fly here for a very long time. The apocalyptic scenes go on and on, and we didn't even see all of it. Half of the airport is guarded by another battalion with its own chain of command. Just like the Ukrainian side, the fighters over here aren't always on the same page. We're going to stay low because we just had a burst of gunfire, but the... Ukrainian position, the other side of the front lines is just about 2,000 meters that way. The Ukrainians have set up at a coal mine at the top of the elevator shaft. The idea of rebuilding this airport with the two sides so close, still shooting one another, even if it's only sporadic and occasional, is unthinkable. We visit Ukrainian troops on the other side of the front lines. This soldier lost his friend to a separatist shell. It blows up in the air and drops shrapnel, and our brother, the only boy with a flak jacket, was the one that died. It's easy to see how this conflict might explode again. There are tens of thousands of miners with nothing to do, and plenty that have already taken up arms. There are also plenty of weapons moving around, 
How would you know whether they're being withdrawn or just moved for another day? Firepower and firewood, essential ingredients in wintertime warfare. It's no surprise historians call this part of the world the bloodlands. I didn't meet a single person on either side who thought the fighting is over. And that includes a commander from the Vostok Battalion. If, we, uh, if you analyze the previous truces that were announced by our side or their side, the Ukrainian side uses the truce to reorganize their troops. And then it starts again with fresh troops. That's what happened in the summer and fall. I'm afraid that's what will happen again. Right around the corner, we bump into another reminder, this is war. A group of men are resuscitating a fighter just hit in a mortar strike. But they lose him. The outlook for eastern Ukraine is bleak. I'd hate to see what a return to the fighting might look like.